Hello, everyone. Um, apologies for my voice being not the best. Um, we'll see how it goes. Um, my name is Thomas Zimmerman. I work on graphics here at SUSE. And the presentation is on the Linux graphics stack. And the reason why I do this presentation is that uh, I regularly get the question how the graphics stack works as a whole. And this has now happened like three or four times. And I already have an email template to explain that. So I thought I could as well give a presentation on it. Um, so um, there's this arrow pointing to a pixel. <clears throat> Keep the pixel in mind. We will go through the graphics stack, through all the steps it takes um, to get this pixel on the screen. Um, but it's very high level and entry level. You don't need any, uh, any uh, knowledge about graphics except for the general Linux things which I assume to be given here. But let's start with some history first. Um, graphics on Linux used to be done with X11 for the first 20 years or so. And um, the uh, X server was doing all the input and output, and the X clients were connecting to it and sending rendering commands. And rendering here really meant um, that the client sent commands like draw a colored rectangle at this or that place on the screen. And the X server would then do this. Um, there are some upsides and downsides to this design. Um, but uh, generally, one of the downsides is that it's fairly slow, especially since X11 worked over networks. And when you have server and clients on different hosts, uh, that network in between implies a certain lag in the uh, drawing and output. That became even worse in the 1990s <clears throat> when 3D graphics became popular, um, because for 3D, you have to keep a certain locality um, right next to the uh, graphics hardware. So best is to just put all your graphics data into the video memory uh, so that the graphics hardware can fetch it quickly. And obviously, this does not work if there is a network uh, between the, uh, the server and the client here. Um, so how was that solved? The Linux developers came up with the direct rendering infrastructure in the late 1990s. <clears throat> and that is a set of components throughout the graphics stack that allow to share buffers between the client and the X server. So the X client would do a 3D rendering directly in a buffer. And uh, the X server would then render this directly to the screen without any networking in between. Um, that made things fast. Um, of course, network was then not possible anymore. Um, this uh, direct rendering infrastructure also um, allowed multiple X clients to use the 3D hardware at the same time um, in a kind of safe and secure way. And um, this buffer sharing um, implemented back then is kind of still the foundation of how the graphics stack works. <clears throat> uh, let's talk a bit about the video memory. I said there needs to be some kind of locality for the 3D graphics to be fast. And that usually means uh, just try to put all your uh, graphics data into video memory where the GPU can exit it fast and uh, try to keep the 3D data there at all cost. Uh, I've listed here a number of different common scenarios how this is built. So, you know, there's a discrete memory <clears throat> on the graphics card itself, um, which is fairly fast if you're the uh, GPU, which is fairly slow if you're the CPU. Um, then there is something called guard memory, which is an extension to that where you set aside some physical memory in the system and your graphics card can access this directly and fetch things like textures um, or, or 3D models directly from the from the main memory. Uh, on SOC boards, you usually have DMA-able memory where the graphics data is located. And on some systems with some cards, it's even possible to use regular system memory uh, with your GPUs. <clears throat> and 
uh, the kernel's direct rendering manager, which is kind of the kernel's framework for, for graphics. Um, it provides a number of common helpers for these use cases. Um, I've listed a few here. So there's one, the uh, TTM, which is useful for discrete graphics. There are helpers for DMA uh, buffers, and there are also helpers for video um, memory and system. Um, and kernel graphics drivers, um, they implement memory management for their hardware. And I would say it's one of the, like the center piece of the driver. Um, so if you get the memory management right, the rest of the driver kind of falls into place. If the memory management is not good, then the, the rest of the driver probably isn't either. Um, and there's this called um, graphics execution manager in the kernel, which is an interface to interact with um, graphics memory. <clears throat> it's an IOCTL interface for user space to call, and uh, it's also an internal interface in the kernel. And um, <clears throat> mentioned here is the uh, gem buffer object, which is kind of the central data structure, or one of the central data structures in the kernel for memory management of graphics memory. Um, keep this in mind, um, because it's really important, and we will come back to it several times. Um, now, those gem interfaces uh, in the kernel and in the form of IOCTS, they provide a number of things. Like, you can put buffer objects into certain locations uh, in the video memory, or you can map them to user space, or you can release them if you don't need them any longer. The one thing they um, generally, the gem generally does not provide is buffer creation, which is kind of surprising, but it makes sense. Those buffer objects, uh, they depend on um, hardware features if you want accelerated rendering. So every graphics driver in the kernel provides its own IOCTL call to um, allocate a special uh, graphics buffer object from its video memory. There's, of course, a uh, kind of workaround for that, which is called dump buffer interfaces. That's another IOCTL interface and also an internal interface. And uh, you can get a graphics buffer with the dump buffer interface, <clears throat> but this one is just for software rendering. Um, you can map the pages, you can mem copy pixel data into the buffer, and then your graphics card will be able to display it, uh, but there's no 3D acceleration. That's good enough for uh, like basic user space or the kernel's console. Um, so before we go into user space, let's do a little recap of what we already have, because we've already like built our first step of, um, of uh, rendering that pixel on the screen. Um, so we have um, video memory whatever kind, and there are buffer objects in that video memory, and we have an interface to interact with those buffer objects, and we can also uh, provide them to user space. And I mentioned that every uh, kernel driver for graphics has its own IOC CTLs, and that implies that there is a user space calling those IOCTLs, and uh, usually that is implemented in the MESA rendering library. <coughs> so there's a kernel driver for your Intel chip, and there's also a MESA driver for your Intel chip, and there's a, um, a, a, um, a kernel driver for your AMD chipset, and there's a MESA driver for AMD, and so on. Um, and MESA provides those those hardware-specific internal drivers, and it also provides um, common software um, interfaces to 3D rendering, such as OpenGL and uh, GLES, Vulkan, and I think a few more. And um, applications use one of those interfaces to call into MESA, and MESA has this intermediate layer called Gallium, which tracks all these interfaces. Um, so when you change something in OpenGL, um, Mesa would translate it into a so-called um, internal state tracker, 
And then your back-end driver for your hardware takes the internal state of Mesa and turns it into something that your hardware understands and forwards it into the kernel's driver, and this one forwards it to the hardware, which then does the rendering or whatever. And same is true for the shaders. If your application has a shader and you hand it over to the OpenGL um, interface, then Mesa would translate it into an internal um, intermediate representation called NIR. And NIR is then handed over to the backend driver, uh, which turns it into something that the, um, the graphics hardware can execute. Um, and all the all the, the data involved in this process, the uh, shaders and uh, uh, the textures and the object meshes and the normal maps and whatever you have, it's all stored in those gem buffer objects um, for the rendering process to consume. Ideally, you would just uh, drop your data and your shaders into the hardware and let the hardware take care of it. And only if something goes wrong, it reports back to the driver that things went wrong. Um, that's not always the case. Uh, I think the one big exception or the most prominent exception is the Raspberry Pi chip, which does not have an <clears throat> um, a separate I.O. MMU for its uh, GPU component, which means on the Raspberry Pi you could write a shader um, load it into the hardware, and that shader could potentially access any location physical memory um, because the hardware does not provide the functionality to avoid that. And in those cases, the DRM kernel drivers have to do extra validation um, of the shader code so that it's guaranteed that the shaders do not access anything they should not access in memory. OK, let's recap again, because that was already the second step. So we have video memory. We have buffer objects in that video memory. We can provide them to user space. And user space does rendering into those buffer objects um, by employing Mesa interfaces, which does all the internal hardware-related things. And when our application has finished rendering, again, it has a buffer object. And that buffer object contains whatever the output of that application is. Let's say um, for a video game, it's the 3D scene. Um, for a scientific application, this could be some visualized data. For a, uh, for a classical user interface, it's maybe just the number of buttons and uh, lists and so on. So now the application itself, it cannot put this image to screen. Um, that's where Wayland becomes important. Wayland is the protocol between the um, application and the compositor. And the compositor is the system's process for, um, for, for uh, arranging the windows and getting things on the screen. So in the, in the old X11 days, you would have said it's kind of the combination of X and uh, a window manager just Today, it's all Wayland. Um, and when the application wants to get its output on the screen, it connects to the compositor. It opens a window. So there are protocol messages to do that. And then it attaches a buffer to that window in the Wayland compositor. And that buffer now contains the buffer object, which we just rendered. And the magic here is that the output that we've just created in our application becomes the input for the compositor. And when the compositor goes through its list of windows and draws the overall screen, uh, it takes the rendered uh, client's buffer and uses it as a texture for its own rendering. And that rendering in the compositor is just regular um, Mesa interfaces like OpenGL. So the easiest way to render this window on the screen is like things like draw a rectangle and put that, um, that client's output as a texture on the rectangle. Uh, Wayland is only for uh, local clients. There is no network transparency involved here. 
because of the buffer sharing, which is central to the whole operation. So how does the buffer sharing work in practice? Uh, I think there are two ways to do that. The simple one is just um, system memory. So your client, uh, it creates a file descriptor that is backed by system memory, and it transfers it over a Unix socket to the compositor, and the compositor maps those pages, and whatever is in the buffer behind that file descriptor is then available for rendering to the uh, to the compositor. That is uh, fairly portable, but it's also slow. So those pages behind the file descriptor, it's um, it's system memory, so you can really only use it with software rendering, and um, also the client has to finish rendering the buffer before it can tell the compositor to update its screen. Um, so the client would do the rendering into the pages there and then send a so-called damage message to the compositor which says, look, this part of my window has been changed, uh, please update. And of course, if the compositor starts before the client is ready, then um, the output is kind of garbage. Um, so there's a better um, scheme to do this, uh, which is called DMA buff. That's a kernel structure, data structure, the DMA buff. And it uh, is used for sharing um, pages between drivers and maybe applications. And here our client also creates GAM objects, um, but with um, these driver-specific interfaces, it can now use 3D rendering, and um, our client has, our, has this buffer object and now dumps all the rendering commands to the hardware and lets the hardware um, do the rendering asynchronously. And while it's doing that, it's basically holding a lock on this DMA buff. And um, when, the, when the hardware has done rendering, it calls back to the driver, tells the driver, okay, I'm I finished rendering what you've given me here, and um, then that lock is being released. And when that happens, the compositor can come in, take the hardware rendered output, and use it for its own rendering. And um, the thing here is that this runs asynchronously. So as soon as the, um, the client has send all its rendering commands to the hardware, it can inform the compositor that uh, the, um, uh, there's a, a, something changed in this window, and the compositor can already start rendering its own output. And only when it wants to fetch that client's buffer object, it needs the uh, respective locks, and um, that's how they synchronize. Yeah, I've basically explained this already, um, how this works. Uh, this, I've just um, explained this with two participants, the client and the compositor, but uh, this can be fairly complex, so there is a, a job scheduler in the DRM framework in the kernel which sorts these um, rendering jobs and makes sure that they don't interfere with each other in bad ways. Um, and um, video decoding, just a word on that, that works in the same way. So if your client uh, does not do 3D rendering, but does video decoding, uh, it possibly uses some of those interfaces I list there. I think VAIP API is an Intel thing, VDPAU is an NVIDIA, I think. There's maybe Vulkan video, I'm not sure how popular that is. Um, but internally, if you have hardware, then you can use the same synchronization schemes with DMA buffs, and um, things can run asynchronously. And also the Linux kernels uh, media subsystem uses DMA buffs, so if you have a USB um, webcam or so, um, you can use the synchronization as well. The main difference here is the color formats. Um, so the regular rendering is RGB and these are these YUV formats. Okay, 
Um, <clears throat> so let's recap again, because this was already our third step um, to get that pixel on the screen. So we have our video memory, we have those buffer objects, we have provided them to user space, and user space has rendered into the buffer object and um, shared it with the compositor, and our compositor, it built the overall screen um, that is to be shown to the user on the monitor. And now the next question is, how, um, how do we get this final screen that the compositor created from the individual application windows to the screen? And this is where the mode setting pipeline comes into place. Again, the compositor's output is a buffer object, and we can attach this buffer object to a so-called DRM frame buffer, which is a data structure in the kernel, and it gives our buffer object a color format and a resolution, and then it's like um, an image. Um, and the compositor is privileged in the sense that it can uh, program the display mode, that's called mode setting, and it can also set which uh, frame buffer is being displayed to the monitor, that's called page flipping. Uh, so when a compositor wants to display its own output and instructs the DRM driver to set a display mode, if it hasn't done that already, and to um, display the frame buffer with the output uh, stored in the, in the buffer object. <clears throat> and DRM now provides the individual stages for the mode setting pipeline from frame buffers to the actual monitor. Um, like I list the most important here, planes, CRTCs, encoders, connectors. There are a few more, but those are the ones um, that you need at the minimum. Um, so let's talk about the planes a bit. Um, a plane in this context, it's a hardware building block or feature uh, that displays a frame buffer. Um, so usually you have a primary plane that is the like the overall screen, and that's at the very bottom of the plane stack. And in um, many cases, there is a cursor plane floating above it, which displays the mouse cursor. And the uh, thing here is that those two planes are fairly independent from each other, and the hardware is doing all the, uh, the compositing of those planes. So you can move your, uh, your mouse cursor, and you don't, uh, you don't need to redraw the primary plane uh, to move the mouse cursor, the hardware does it for you. And between the primary plane and um, the mouse uh, cursor plane, there are so-called overlay planes, and um, those, if they are provided by hardware, those usually have like special functionality, for example, displaying video frames. Um, I mentioned that clients maybe want to display videos, um, and they have a certain color format, and uh, those overlay planes, if they support the color format, they would then uh, do the color format conversion internally. And the um, compositor can pick those planes, attach frame buffers with video frames on them, and uh, the hardware would um, do the necessary steps to get this on the screen. Um, so once you have your plane set up, there's the CRTC, which takes all the active planes and fetches pixels from them and turns them into something, some pixel stream according to the display mode that's been programmed. So it takes the primary planes, first pixel on the first scan line, and then takes all the overlay planes that are there, and then takes the mouse cursor if there's any, and um, merges them into a single pixel and sends it down. The, uh, towards the monitor. Then it goes to the next pixel on the first scan line, uh, takes the primary planes um, pixel, the overlay um, pixels, the mouse cursor, if there's any, and sends this down the um, um, uh, mode setting pipeline towards the monitor. And it does this and goes through all the scan lines and all the pixels until the um, frame has been displayed. Then it goes back to the top and starts again. Um, <clears throat> Um, 
after the uh, CRTC, there's a connector and an encoder. The connector is kind of obscure, I think. Um, it uh, transforms the display signal uh, from the incoming pixel data to the signal, whatever the, um, the output understands. It's rarely used, I think. It's just kind of you need it, but not really functional. Um, and the, the connector um, in the mode setting pipeline of DRM, this represents your physical connector on your device. And it also represents the monitor. And that connector data structure is also um, where you can get information about the monitor. Um, this is called EDIT data, and it has information about the monitor's uh, no resolution, color, spaces, uh, supported display modes. Connectors can fetch it from the monitor and provide it to user space so that your compositor knows um, which display modes to, to show, for example, or how color correction needs to be implied. Um, <clears throat> One thing here is that uh, if you have a complex mode setting pipeline, it can happen that um, you over allocate. So for example, you have a primary plane that needs a frame buffer. You have a number of overlay planes. They all need frame buffers. And then you have your mouse cursor, and suddenly you're out of video memory. And then you don't have a mouse on your monitor, which is not optimal. Not a good user experience. Uh, so what DRM provides here is called atomic mode setting. Um, so what I've just described is light of a long-term or long-standing problem in, um, in uh, graphics interfaces. And DRM has solved it in the form of atomic mode setting, where you have like a check phase and a commit phase. And all your individual elements of the mode setting pipeline, the planes, the CRTC, the encoders, and connectors, and so on, they all have state, and you have this overall state of your whole pipeline. And before you do any changes to your output, you do this atomic check on all the individual um, stages in the pipeline and see if your update would actually work. And if it does, you commit your update, and if it doesn't, it is rejected as a whole. Uh, so this guarantees that you will never end up in a state where you have no mouse cursor. <clears throat> um, so um, let's recap before we <clears throat> wrap this up here. Uh, so we have our um, video memory. We have buffer objects in the video memory. We um, provide those buffer objects to user space, it does its rendering, then it calls the compositor for displaying the window. The compositor also does a lot of rendering and finally gets to its own output buffer, and that output buffer is then sent into the uh, mode setting pipeline together with uh, display mode and maybe some additional information. And um, the uh, DRM mode setting pipeline just sends it all to the monitor, and now the pixel where the arrow pointed to on like the first slide or so, it's now visible on the screen. Um, a few more points that might be worth talking about. Um, you know there's a console displayed sometimes, um, and that uh, is being displayed when nothing else has control over mode setting. Uh, so when your user space compositor opens the device file for mode setting, that console goes away. And um, when the user space compositor closes the device file, the frame buffer console comes back. And um, internally, the console is kind of a, a, like a DRM client and also an old frame buffer driver. It's a kind of bizarre mixture of subsystems, but it works at least. Um, <clears throat> then DRM has a feature called DRM leases. And this one allows your compositor to temporarily hand over mode setting permissions to, your, to a client. And it's useful for 3D headsets. If you have a 3D headset, you have two screens. And you have to keep them in sync. And if they are not in sync, um, users get motion sickness, headaches, 
maybe it just doesn't look good. And it's a hard problem to solve in a compositor. So your compositor gives um, mode setting capabilities to that client, which can then control the displays itself. Um, there's no networking support in Wayland. I mentioned that. Uh, compositors usually implement the remote desktop protocol, um, but it's entirely independent from Wayland. Um, if you still have X11 um, applications, there's X Wayland, and X Wayland runs on top of the Wayland stack and is an X server for those old um, uh, those old X X11 applications. It's not 100% compatible, but it's kind of good enough for most of the applications. And X Wayland simply transfers X11 and Wayland um, into each other. And also, final point here, there is a new, LO, uh, uh, new accelerator subsystem in the kernel, and it was merged in the current or the previous release, I think. Uh, yeah, the accelerator subsystem is like DRM, but without graphics. The chips are very similar, just that the accelerator has no, no display output. Um, right, so we've just speed run through the graphics um, the graphics stack from um, um, uh, memory management to rendering to compositing to uh, display mode output. And that's basically it. I don't think there's much time left for Q&A. Um, if you have questions, I'm also around here. Thanks for your attention.